lot of Nigerians alive can easily relate to household names in politics and government right from the First Republic, when the country was just taking its baby steps to self-actualization. Names like Chief Obafemi Awolowo, Dr. Namdi Azikwe, Alhaji Tafa Balewa, Chief Dennis Osadebe, and Malam Aminukano used to jump off the pages of Nigerian history books. But that was before history itself became a victim of the same circumstances which many political observers blame the country's ongoing struggles to nationhood on. For a look at this and other matters aiding Nigeria at this point, and indeed bask in the euphoria of positive landmarks and national accomplishments, we're now being joined by Odia Omeifun, poet, author, philosopher, frontline nationalist, and a First Republic personal secretary to the late sage, Chief Obafemi Awolowo. Welcome to the program, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Odia uh, Ofemo. Thank you for joining us. Well, we've just been having a conversation with your brother and friend, uh, Professor Patu told me. So it's exciting to also have you on a special day like this. But quickly, um, we started by having a look at the uh, broadcast by President Buhari today. And one of the issues the president raised in that uh, broadcast is how did we get here and how do we work together to take Nigeria to a better future? What are your thoughts? Thanks for having me. I am not sure we have the, the time to do justice to the question. But I can tell you, it is always best to look at what kind of solutions we want before we even discuss where we are coming from. i tell you why I'm starting from that angle. We've had it too often that Nigeria is a country that is made up of several ethnic groups. And many people have reached the conclusion that because we are so diverse, unity is almost out of line. But there is no country in the world that is really united in the sense in which many people talk about unity. To talk about Nigeria in terms of a diversity should just force us to ask when the Europeans came, what did they do, and what we sh should we have done in return? My solution, and I think the best that Nigeria has been giving over the years, is that we should just have allowed ourselves to have all the knowledge in the English language translated into our indigenous languages, and all the knowledges in the indig indigenous languages translated into English. Equalize the situation between the colonizer and the colonized, and let genuine competition begin, meaning that every ethnic group and fraction in Nigeria would be equal at the level of education and would therefore be able to lay claim to employment for every, Niger every, every person born to a Nigerian man or woman. If we did that, if we did that, and employment was therefore the basis for engaging in genuine development. We won't have to use the ethnic measures that we employ at the moment. Now, having said this, and making it clear that there is actually a solution, and that it is possible for all Nigerians to have education, to have employment, and to be available for genuine social welfare in, 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 the, in, in, in old age. The question is, what are the things that have prevented us from arrive, arriving there? I was listening to Patu Tomi just before I entered, and I can see he has already laid out quite a good theoretical basis for a, a discussion. 
But let's do it this way. We don't always go to our history. And one way to go to our history, in my view, is to be very brutal in getting to the facts. All Nigerian ethnic groups, all without exception, have been related from time immemorial, which is another way of saying that almost all the ethnic groups in Nigeria belong to common language families. They have been belong to migrations that are related to one another, so that today, if we decide not to be as parochial as we have always been, you can tell that the Igbo, the Yoruba, the Fulani, the Edo, and very many of the ethnic, ethnic groups around the Niger Benway belong to, this, to the same language family. The only language family that is not part of that complex was Hausa because it was a Nilo Saharan language. But it mixed with the Fulani who belong, who belong to the same language family as the Yoruba, the Igbo. Every Nigerian has fought very hard to create a distance between one and the other. But when you look hard into it, you will find that no matter how you draw the migrations, if you listen to the, the folklore, the mythology, the origin, oh, charters of origin that all the ethnic groups in Nigeria have, you will find that whether they claim to come from Iraq, as some people say for, for the Hausa and the, and the Yoruba, or from Israel, as recent Biafran uh, groups have claimed, they all moved down in the way that Af black people had moved up and they interacted in their various migrations in such a way that if you pay attention to the languages spoken by all of them, our linguists in various universities have reached the conclusion that the language spoken by the Igbo is related to the Yoruba, and the language spoken by the Yoruba is related to that of the Fulani. It is even claimed that the Igbo and the Yoruba belonged not just to the, to the same community, and that when, when, that, when, that company, when that company broke, when that community broke, it broke, it broke in, in such a way that when that community broke, it broke in a manner that increased the tempo of migration in various directions so that you can claim today that the Igbo belong to the western side of the river Niger before the division, this, this civil war situation caused the migration to the eastern side of the Niger. They passed through other ethnic fractions. The Igala were a primary, uh, a, a primary function within that, that migration. The Yoruba and the Nupe shared common king lists. These are things that history books are not teaching us. And as for, the, as, as for other groups, it is important always to remember that whether they were migrating from, from Israel, Iraq, or wherever else they migrated from, some became land owners. 
others became supporters of slave hunters. Those who worked with the slave hunters did not always act as sedentary people. And the kind of migrations that have taken place between all of them is such that we ought to take very special interest in how they fractured, how their languages interacted before the British came. Once we talk about the British coming, we must know that we are talking about, about colonizers. It is not the business of a, colon, a, col, a colonizer to, it is not the business of a colonizer to, to bring those they have colonized together. And we seem to have forgotten that completely. We are the ones who should make the effort to go beyond what the colonizer did. But we are still working within the very, very unkind, unkind arrangements that the British, that the British put, put together. We have now reached the point where some ethnic groups believe they must colonize others or ritually determine how others must perform such that they can either stop them from, from developing, destroy their advantages, or simply reinterpret the slave codes that once divided dead our people so much that the British kept talking about intertribal wars. They were not intertribal inter wars. They were slave wars. They were angles towards putting other people down and putting other people up. The British did not build a civic code for Nigeria. That is to say, we were never allowed to become common citizens. And we have not managed to become common citizens until we do become common citizens, in which case no one ethnic group is a suzerain over another. We are not building a country. Thank you, sir. That's a new spin on the word neocolonialism, and it's very um, important to note that this is where we are at this point. Hence the agitation that we get from all over the country. Everybody literally wants to secede at the moment, from the Biafra agitators to the Odudua Nation agitators. How can we actually achieve unity, seeing as this theme of the 60th anniversary of our independence is togetherness? Is that a pipe dream, or can it possibly be a reality? And I want to get a bit personal with you, sir. When were you proudest to be Nigerian? It is important that you are asking that question as a second question. I was 10 years old when Nigeria became independent. We were the marchers in the public square on that day. We had flags given to every child. And we had these special cups made by Nepal. I think the company is still in existence in Lagos today. It was the cup with which we drank on Independence Day. And then we were feted like princes and queens. We, we are really made to feel that that future everybody talked about belonged to us. There was a sense in which complain as Nigerians we are doing. They knew that they were more likely to get their due than not. At least in the Western region, you knew 
you had the right to free education as a child, and you had free health up to the age of 18. If you did not have it, I mean, the, the joke began with, 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 with the government saying, free education will be compulsory. When the political party, the ruling political party lost the 1954 federal election, it learned a lesson. So it made education free, but not compulsory. But that was a government which began free education in 1955, knowing that the money, knowing that the money available will not go beyond three years plus. And because they knew that money would not, would, would, would not carry, carry the day, they insisted before they started that program that all taxpaying adults must pay a 10 shilling levy. It was a time when government could still plan, save so much money over a period in order to be sure that a necessary project will be realized. I don't know any Nigerian who will be told today that if they pay the levy, the government will do something in five years' time. Because across Nigeria, there, we have governments that, that collected water rates and, and special water levies for more than 40 years, and no drop of water came from anywhere. Now, but that was a time when it was possible for, for that to happen. The breakdown, the breakdown began properly with independence. Because what we asked for at independence did not chime with what all of us wanted. There were different ambitions in different regions of Nigeria. Put it this way, some people believed that once independence came, it was the, it was the turn of their ethnic group to take over Nigeria and run it. The necessity to have every Nigerian achieve the same, the same civic codes was not properly fought for. So you would have an action group government that wanted education for every child fighting against a northern region, regional government that was not exactly opposed to free education, but wanted it for a few. And the few who were supposed to be the, the children of the of the Sarakuna, the, the, the people who would own the world, could not have been well designed because it meant that, it meant that if you couldn't think of everybody as part of that civic code, you were not likely to produce a fair deal even for those ones whom you were putting through school. The struggle between the various regions led to a, a division of the spoils, which required, in a system of, of first past the post electoral system, it required that only, only a coalition could make a government possible. And the, gov the coalition that was built up was one that pushed for two political parties in government, one political party and all others out of it. But those in government worked very hard to make sure that the division of the po spoils took a turn that would lead to a crisis. It was clear from day one that it was going to lead to a crisis. The crisis it led to began with 
the winners taking over all the jobs at the federal level and making it impossible for the third region, the western region at that time, to pitch into the share out. When I am narrating this story, I always like to put it this way, that when the action group was knocked out of the sharing, the two political parties that were in alliance at the center could not work out that civic code with which they should have started the journey. Before long, a share out system was evolved which said if the North would always be in control, but they did not have enough personnel to handle it, then it can work out an arrangement with a state that had personnel, even if it could not work out a control system. That was how Nigeria managed to have a government in which much of the share out of personnel favored the Eastern region and the National Council of Nigerian Citizens. But four years later, what was left was very interesting. Those who took all the jobs suddenly discovered that all the commanding heights of the economy were under those who did not fill the personnel slots. All the military installations went to the northern region. The Kainji Dam went to the northern region. The iron and steel industry, which was, which was posted by an international consortium to go to the, to the east, got another consortium which insisted that it must also go to the north. Now, at that point, the coalition began to shake and not have a focus. Because if all that made Nigeria a proper country in infrastructural terms was going in one direction, all the railway extensions were in one region, you were likely to have a situation where the others no longer felt they were part of the country. If the coalition partners no longer felt that they were part of what was going on, you can imagine how the opposition would feel, especially because they had no share out except what their own ingenuity could provide. One of the, one of the issues we must not forget is that this was what led to the coup. The, the, the election that took place in 1964, after all the opposition had been smashed, their leaders sent to jail or exile, that election took place with political parties where 80 of the candidates, that is the ruling party had 80 of the candidates returning unopposed. Once that election took place, it, it was clear that something dramatic was about to happen because Namdi Azikwe, the governor general, refused to call Balewa to form a government. Normally, there is nothing in the constitution of Nigeria that says the governor general can take such a decision. But he took such a decision and there was such okay, a... Okay, sir. Okay, well, okay, sir. Let, me, let me say why I'm saying this, because we need to, to say that this what what led okay. to the first coup. Okay, okay, sir. We need to go to, to uh, Eagle Square for the celebrations, you know, for uh, the celebration, Independence Day celebration. Let's just take uh, footage from there and stay with that before we come back to you, sir. Thank you so much uh, for your time, sir. Okay.
and flawlessly executed by these wonderful men and women marching to celebrate the freedom of our great nation, Nigeria. That is, of course, the transition from slow time to quick time. Of course, the other two highlights of parades such as this is the individual guard halting and the advance in review order. We shall witness all of that shortly while we focus our gaze to appreciate the transition from slow time to quick time. Happy viewing. of our great nation, Nigeria. At this point, I will hand over the commentary to my co-commentator, Major Paul Abara, retire. Major Paul Abara, please. Thank you, Captain Innocent Audu, the special guest of honor, review officer, President Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces and Federal Republic of Nigeria, His Excellency Muhammad Ubuari, GCFR, your Excellencies, all protocols most respectfully observed. It is much past slow and quick time, it's just broken from slow to quick time, synchronized with the rhythm of the mass band on parade. Please, once again, a quick reminder when the colors pass by your sitting position momentarily, please expect to rise. Officers, warrant officers in uniform should please salute. Thank you. Moving towards uh, the presidential days this moment uh, is the parade commander, Lieutenant Colonel Mukhtar Sani Daruda. He doubles as the commanding officer 7 Gas Battalion, followed by the parade YC, number one guard. The drill, the discipline, the militarism is written all over. Thank you so much. Uh, you can see proceedings there from Eagle Squad and Abuja. We're still going to stay on that uh, for the larger part of today's broadcast. I just quickly want to ask you this. Uh, great thought about, you know, understanding our history and unity. But there are some people uh, that are always pushing this mindset, you know, in reaction to what Tundu was saying about a lot of people saying they want to break away with the Republic and the like. That take, for instance, the Yoruba people have never been united. Proud to the British coming, we had a Magbon war going on. We had a Jalumi and Kiriji war going on. 100 years war. 100 years war. So we had always been fighting. So what will give us the assurance that now we will not fight again amongst ourselves? It is important that we have stopped where I was talking about a civil war coming. By the time we had the civil war, Nigeria had reached the point where every fragment wanted to seize power. That is to say, although it was the opposition, they all attacked in the end and jailed for attempted coups. 
every political party in Nigeria was planning a coup. The NPC was planning one, which was supposed to have taken place on January 17, 1966. The, the Eastern region was planning one, which was preempted by another group made up of Igbos and non Igbos, which took place in, on January, January 15, 1966. Almost every part of Nigeria was seeking a special dispensation according to which it would be the dominant arm in the Federation. And it would be the dominant uh, uh, part of the Federation and determine how other, other regions will fit into the sharing out of largesse. Now, once we realize that that is always where it ends, because we are not too far from where we were in 1964, 65, and 66, when the coups were being planned and when the first coup was actually executed. Even when the other, the other coups came, it is interesting how it worked out. Look, the January 15 boys planned that if they won, they will make our Lord, who was in jail their leader. And if he failed, if he failed to be their leader, they would lock him up in the state house and issue decrease, decrease in his name. That eventually did not happen because the coup failed. All the other groups, therefore, we are merely seeking big partners with which to become hegemonic groups in the Nigerian Federation. So we are actually confronted by a situation where the people who wanted to control Nigeria never had a common principle, never had a common principle for organizing themselves. We are still in that situation today where we are still seeking that common principle. I want to assure you that that common principle was always in existence but disallowed. What is required is a Nigeria with groups strong enough between themselves not to change their minds and not to change their language towards the kind of change that we need. I began by saying it is possible for all Nigerians. It is possible for all Nigerians. Every ethnic nationality in Nigeria to be given, to be given a sense of self-governance. If we can't do that in our next constitutional conference or constitutional revisions, we are likely to be where we were at the very, very, very beginning. No one sect or political group can take over Nigeria without granting others their rights of citizenship. All right. I'd like to say a very big thank you to you, uh, Odia Ofemu, a poet, philosopher, frontline nationalist, and first republic personal secretary to the sage himself, Obafemi Aulo.